in Scotland living abroad who often prefer to enroll their sons at Marshall rather than the elder, more internationally prestigious kings. Thus throughout most of the 250 plus years where the two institutions existed as ostensibly separate institutions in the Northeast, though often sharing staff, Marshall became the, the one with the greatest link to an impact on the Scottish diaspora, British empire building, and the internationalization of Aberdeen's student community. What defined Marshall from its inception to the union of the two colleges in 1860, especially during the period of British imperial expansion in the 18th and 19th centuries, was its international student mobility, both in students leaving Marshall for a life abroad and for those coming to Aberdeen from the far corners, not only of the British imperial world, but even further afield. Marshall may have started as an institution for educating the children of local elites, but the Civic University attracted international students as an ideal destination to prepare for public life, which gradually elevated its reputation beyond the northeast of Scotland as an institution firmly embedded in the wider world. However, the focus remained on the quality of Marshall's MA degree, the first degree. In relation to higher degrees, at least on the international stage, kings remained more prominent in the sort of a per capita sense and prestigious. It is worth noting that higher degrees were not as today. Instead, they were a combination of the modern honorary doctorate and degree by publication. In effect, someone who had earned by publication and practice a high standing in their profession, specifically law, medicine, and divinity, could be nominated by someone to a given university, such as King's. The faculty of the institution would then consider the individual's life and work based on the nomination and decide whether to award an advanced degree. The key point for this discussion is that the person receiving the award and indeed the nominators may well never have set foot in Aberdeen. So, for example, we see a Benjamin Franklin recommending people for a nomination that the, the person recommended and Franklin obviously had never been there. In other words, the nominators and the potential recipient would have approached the institution in large part because of its profile. Internationally, Kings and Marshall were almost equally attractive for a higher degree. In the period for which records survive, roughly 1600 to 1860, the smaller kings awarded 78 higher degrees to men who lived out with the British Isles, while Marshall, with a larger enrollment, awarded only 86. This ratio of higher degrees contrasts markedly from the apparent international profile of each as a destination for actual resident study. In other words, the MA, the first degree, among students first of the British Isles. In the same period, King's attracted only 11 students who came from abroad, while Marshall attracted 231. Indeed, Marshall attracted more students from abroad in the six decades, 1800 to 1859, where you see 189, before the union of the two, than the new United University of Aberdeen did in the 64 years, 1860 to 1914, after the Union and before the Great War, at the height of Britain's empire when only 128 students came to Aberdeen from abroad. The international reach of the Marshall MA, as opposed to that of King's, is even more evident when one considers those students who left Aberdeen after study at King's or Marshall for a life abroad. In the same period, 18, 1600 to 1860, King's had 115 students who moved abroad. Contrast this, while Marshall had 458. It is also interesting to consider where these students went. Marshall had considerably more students who made a living in the growing empire. However, there were some interesting differences. Marshall students were overwhelmingly drawn to the Indian subcontinent, but the Caribbean and its slave-based economies was Interestingly, more attractive than North America, which largely meant Canada. 127 students versus 84 to the American colonies and Republic from Marshall and King's combined. However, King's students were more likely to head to North America than either the subcontinent or the Caribbean. 
Indeed, further down the table, one sees Marshall students heading to Australasia rather than Africa, while the reverse was true for King's students. What is particularly clear, though, is the obvious attraction for Marshall students to areas dominated by the East, English East India Company and the thriving slave economies of the Caribbean. Indeed, 107 of the 179 students from the two institutions who went to the Caribbean went to Jamaica alone, while 334 of 373 students went to India, Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, and Myanmar, then Burma. <clears throat> what is overwhelmingly clear is that for most part, the students from Aberdeen, largely from Marshall, but including some from Kings, were drawn not to places of settlement as colonists, but to areas where there was wealth to be made as conquerors, administrators, and participants in slave plantation economies. One possible explanation for the difference in the destinations for Marshall and King's students is explained by their career choices, their professions. The range of career paths chosen by Marshall students going abroad was much more diverse than King's. Medicine, 30% 30, 30 128 students, is the dominant profession for Marshall students, obviously, while for King's it is the ministry, a full 60%, 66 students. As ministers were more in demand among settler communities, it explains the draw for these King students to places such as North America. Likewise, while Marshall did produce educators, this was a much more significant profession for Kings, 13% versus 4%. Though because so many more go abroad from Marshall, uh, it's actually rep it's 17 students from Marshall, but only 15 from Kings. The differing predominance of roles closely connected with imperial expansion and consolidation, military officers, administration, politics, planters, law and finance at Marshall and Kings is noticeable. The total for these at Kings is 14 students, 13%, does not even equal the number of, for education from Kings, which is 15 students. While at Marshall, the 197 students in these professions represents nearly half the total, 46%. The range of professions alone is also fascinating. King students went into 10 careers. Obviously, this is where we know what career they went into. The range of professions, um, Marshall had, the, had 11 professions noted on the table and a further seven, artist, author, chemist, clothier, journalist, police, and printer. This range reinforces the idea that at least when it came to the sort of student from Aberdeen in the Northeast attracted to a life abroad, that Marshall produced students who went into careers much less connected with any specific university or training apart from medicine, such as clergy, education, and law. Indeed, in these latter three, clergy, education, law, there was little difference in the number of students, 83 from Kings and 102 from Marshall, but a noticeable difference in the preponderance of these professions. A full 77% of King's students are from those three professions where it's only 24 from Marshall. Even adding in medicine, a profession clearly related to university education, the numbers are interesting. 97%, 97 of King's students, a full 90% are from those four professions, medicine, clergy, education, law. For Marshall, it's only 54%, 230 students. Marshall was clearly an institution which attracted students who went into a much wider range of careers after university and into professions which on the surface would not have directly benefited from a university education. This reinforces the idea that Marshall was an institution largely created by the town's elite to provide their sons with a basic level of higher education to prepare them for a wide range of careers, while kings continued to recruit, at least as evidenced by those going abroad, those interested in profess closely linked with higher education. While it might be tempting to think that Marsha was attracting a poorer student who as a result was drawn to the possibility of wealth abroad, I think this would actually be hard to prove and, and I, I don't think it actually um, makes a great deal of sense. 
It is perhaps safer to suggest that the reasons why students went to King's or Marshall prior to pursuing a life abroad differed. Kings throughout the period sent students abroad who were overwhelmingly interested in a life as a clergyman or to a much lesser degree as an educator or medical practitioner. One can see a very clear link between their education at a university and these three careers. For Marshall, the link is less obvious. Yes, medicine and the cloth were the leading career choices for Marshall students who went abroad, which, as with King students, suggests these students went to Marshall for the purpose of studying medicine or theology to proceed into closely related careers. Thereafter, the link is less obvious. Careers in the military, government, banking, and as merchants would not necessarily require or benefit from higher education. Whatever reasons may have attracted the town's children to Marshall, it was not to acquire an education to prepare for a specific profession. Nor was, was it, nor it would seem, was it to spend their lives in settler colonies, such as Canada and the American colonies, and later Australia and New Zealand, but rather to take advantage of the opportunities presented in areas of imperial conquest, such as India, and exploitation, such as the West Indian slave economies. It is perhaps worth looking at a few of these individuals in detail. The greatest source of foreign born students was the West Indies. For example, Andrew Watson, who studied from 1779 until he took his MA in 1783, arrived from Jamaica and was later a teacher and minister in Tarlin. In other words, he came from Jamaica, but settled in Scotland. Throughout the last decades of the 18th century, about a student a year matriculated from the West Indies. There is good reason to suppose that some, probably most, were of mixed race parentage, as there were then few European women in the colonies, and their fathers were usually noted as involved in the plantation economies. Most importantly, it is important to stress and remember the involvement of many of these Marshall students, both from abroad and who went abroad in the slave economies of the West Indies. A perfect example is William James Angus. He arrived in 1799, taking his MA degree four years later in 1803. He was the son of William, so William the Elder, of Montego Bay, Jamaica, who lived at Miranda Hill, where he was noted as having 45 slaves in 1809, a small but substantial plantation for Jamaica, where the median plantation was worked by about 150 enslaved people. The younger William, after he got his MA, went back to work with his father in running the plantation. In 1817, one sees the first student suggesting a shift in the imperial reach of Marshall from the Caribbean to the East Indies. That year, Andrew Armstrong from Bengal matriculated for a year. Now, it's perhaps worth saying at this point that most of these students who are arriving are probably 16 years old. And a trip from Bengal is months, something like six months. The following year, William Finch from Calcutta matriculated for two years. And again, I would note that matriculating but not graduating is not uncommon anywhere in higher education in the, the sort of, I don't know, pre-mid 19th century. People very often uh, just go for a little bit and then leave and do something else or may go to another university and receive their degree there. William Finch overlapped with John Duncan, who arrived in 1819, receiving his MA four years later in 1823. He was the son of a Bombay doctor. This shows the increasing importance of the Scottish migration to the East India Company holdings in Bengal. Frederick Sutter, son of a Calcutta merchant, matriculated in 1820, as did William Arrow, who stayed for an extra year, 1821, and he was the son of a soldier in Bengal. Brothers James and Edward Cook arrived from Calcutta in the same year, 1820. As with arrivals from the Caribbean, there is every reason to suspect that these early students from India were of mixed race parentage. One also begins to see the first arrivals from beyond the continent who were not always Scottish, or at least from somewhere in the British Isles. It was in the 1830s that Marshall attracted perhaps its, perhaps its most famous, but largely unknown non-Scottish foreign student, Hosea 
Jose Maria Montalegre arrived in 1831, taking his MA four years later in 1834 from Costa Rica, where his father was a merchant as a, and he came as a private student, though he obviously at some point changed over and eventually received his MA. He was the first Costa Rican to study medicine in Europe. And he went back and practiced medicine for many years. His brother was Juan Rafael Mora, who was president of Costa Rica from 1849 to 1859. Monte Alegre, having returned to Costa Rica to practice medicine, which he did for quite a few years, overthrew Mora and became the next president from 1859 to 1863. And while in office, he oversaw the writing and acceptance of a new constitution in 1859 and left office after a peaceful transition of power. His brother Francisco also came as a student, but only stayed for two years, returning to Costa Rica with his brother when his brother graduated, but he obviously didn't. These brothers exemplify some features seen repeatedly in students coming to Aberdeen from abroad, whether of Scottish ancestry or not. Siblings often arrive together, or people or young boys clearly from the same town traveling together. Medicine was a significant draw, and Marshall had a reputation which was largely but not wholly confined to the children of the Scottish diaspora. While the Costa Rican brothers exemplify Marshall's medical reputation abroad, others provide a window into the globalized life of students in the expanding British imperial world. This imperial world provided considerable opportunities for students from within Scotland. A perfect example of this is George Cummins Strand. His father was a Fraserburgh minister and later master of Gordon's Hospital in Aberdeen. George was an aide de camp to Gladstone, who later became prime minister, as a major in the Art Royal Artillery stationed in the Greek Ionian Islands. This undoubtedly catapulted him to his later roles, which you can see. Further administrative appointments in various capacities followed in the Bahamas, and then moving to Lagos and the Gold Coast, and then back to the Windward Islands and Barbados. If nothing else, think of the difficulty of making these trans transitions. He acted as administrator of the Cape of Good Hope and High Commissioner of South Africa, and then became governor of Tanzania in 1881 to 1886. And in that role, he was responsible for convening and formally opening the first meeting of the Federal Council of Australasia held at Hobart in 1886. He was made a Knight Commander of the Military Order of St. Michael and St. George in 1880 and, and was awarded an honorary Doctor of Law in the way I've explained it by the United University of Aberdeen in 1881. He died en route to taking up his next post as governor of Hong Kong. Now remember, this was the son of a minister from Fraserburgh. What these students and the more general statistics demonstrate is that Marshall was, cons was consistently true to its origins. It was founded as an institution to provide local sons of Aberdeen and the Northeast with a strong educational basis for success in later life. This focus on the international aspects of these students shows just how broad that base proved to be. Students went from Marshall into the growing British imperial world in a surprisingly wide array of professions and in surprisingly large numbers. Likewise, largely, but not entirely, for Scots in that imperial world, who were probably of Northeast extraction themselves, Marshall remained an institution to which they too sent their sons for a wide and useful education. Overall, Marshall had a reputation sufficient to attract from abroad even non-Scots who also wanted their sons to benefit from the type of education and focus it could provide. What began as a tune school for the benefit of local sons remained true to that purpose and was so successful as to continue to draw back to the tune and its college, Scots and others from the farthest corners of the British imperial world and beyond. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that, Bill. That was absolutely fascinating as usual. Um, okay, so guys, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, anything that you want to ask, anything you want to comment on, you're very welcome to do so. Um, as a little reminder, the way you access the chat is to open the Collaborate panels. So that's the purple icon you'll see at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And, uh, and then you just click on the little speech bubble and then you're ready to go and you can type in anything you like. And we've got a, we've already had a clapping emoji from, from someone in the chat. So obviously it's been enjoyed so far. Um, I'll ask a quick question, um, kind of from our discussion yesterday. Um, the, how, you know, you're saying that, you, that it's, it was very likely that, you know, these students that were coming from other parts of the world were, would have been mixed race because of the situation that they came from. And do you think that that was sort of common across universities in Scotland, or is that more for Marshall? Or no, it's 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 common across um, I, not just Scottish universities, but universities. Um, I think not only generally in the UK, but I would imagine in in other expanding imperial powers. The the fact of the matter is is that that most imperial expansion in the 18th and particularly early 19th centuries was basically men going abroad and making their fortune. And they very often got in, involved with local women. Um, and, and at least, I don't know about other places as well as I know Scotland, but certainly the norm in Scotland was you just sent your kid back and, and also sent daughters back as well, not necessarily for education, but just you know, to be to be brought up with family, and if they died abroad, quite often their children went back to relatives in in Scotland, and no one seems to be overly concerned about this, and they don't notice. And one of the problems is obviously because they have European-sounding names, it's very hard to find these people and realize that they're mixed race. It's it's very easy to just assume that someone is is has a European parent and a European mother, a father and mother, simply because of their name. But but quite often that's not true. Perfectly good example. There's a there's a fantastic case in the early 19th century involving the granddaughter of of, of Dame um, Cumming Gordon. So a member of the Gordon family, one of the most prominent in Scotland. And it's a it's a it's a trial that relates to defamation and 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 the girl in school and stuff like that. That's not that's neither here nor there. But what is interesting is that it's only because of some stuff that's said in the trial itself that we realized that this girl's mother would have been a Muslim from India. And when her father died, he had his daughter sent to his grandmother, to his mother, her grandmother, to care for her. Now, there's nothing in her name or anything else. That, and she goes, she grows up in the Northeast. She marries a minister in the Northeast. And you would just think, right, OK, um, she's just Scottish. Well, no, she's she's Scottish and Indian Muslim. That's so interesting. And, and from a, um, you, you know, I think we kind of touched on this yesterday as well. But um, the I think I was surprised by kind of how international um, Marshall was for the time. And, you know, we think about how we attract students now when we recruit students and, you know, we've got the internet, we've got all these wonderful ways of communicating. So how was the sort of reputation of, of Marshall communicated to these people so that they would want to travel all that way? Well, I, first of all, I think it's important to understand how incredibly well respected Scottish higher education was in the 18th and 19th century, particularly because of medicine. Um, so you were you were considered to have received a great medical education if you went to one of the Scottish universities. It's also important to know that that, for example, my alma mater in the States, William and Mary, was founded by an Aberdeen graduate. It's the second oldest university in America. The first oldest in Harvard was was founded using the curriculum that was basically in use in Edinburgh. So the entire American higher educational system is, in fact, devised based on Scottish models. So it just gives you an idea of, of the sort of reputation it, it Scottish education was held in worldwide. And, and the fact that you get someone like that from coming from Costa Rica, not going to anywhere in the Spanish speaking world, but coming and, and, and not going even to England, not anywhere near London or something like that, but to the northeast of Scotland. Well, they wanted good medical education. And this is where you came to get it. Um, um, yeah, Chloe's asking quite interesting question. Did, you, did exchange programs exist like they do today? Could someone from here spend a term abroad? No, but as I suggested, um, 
students very often didn't attend just one university. And this goes back to the medieval period. Um, so from the beginning of say St. Andrews and things like that, it was very common to maybe do a year at a Scottish university and then maybe go to some place in France. And if you were interested in medicine, you very often then ended up in Italy. And you might finish your career and go work, you know, as an academic or a doctor somewhere else, and maybe come back to Scotland to retire. Um, Duncan Little, who's one of the great benefactors of, of the university, both Marshall and Kings, from around 1600, 1610, <clears throat> starts in Aberdeen, ends up in Germany, teaches there, is the first person to teach, and then comes back here and is the first person to teach Copernican and and Tycho Brahe's I and Kepler's ideas in Scotland. And the vast majority of his life was spent in German universities. He, he just ended up here um, to retire and died and left us, well, at the time, most of the land between kings and dice. And um, his, his bequest was still supporting students and a professorship of, ma of mathematics in 1860, so 250 years later. That's amazing, thank you. And um, this is quite a fun one. Um, you, uh, someone saying uh, about Elizabeth Hallam's book, Anatomy Museum, 2017. Uh, rumor has it there was an underground tunnel between the college and dock to transport anatomy products. Bill, do you know if there's truth in this rumor? No, I, I have to say that um, one of the one of the most common features of all kinds of things in the past is is hidden underground tunnels. Um, they they tend to to show up in all kinds of situations. And in most cases, they, they prove to be false. What would certainly be the case is there would have been a lively trade in, in the early part of the 19th century in illegally obtained corpses. That's appalling as that is. Yeah. And I noticed Fiona talks about her great uncle um, going to South Africa. What is very interesting to me is, is actually in the early 19th century, you are seeing African students from South Africa, from the, from the Cape Colony, coming to Aberdeen again to study medicine. Uh, and very often, um, you can sort of tell from the town they're from, they're showing up at the same time as an English speaker, someone of Scottish extraction from the same town. <clears throat> and so my guess is they're traveling as a group. And as you can imagine, you know, if you're putting a 16 year old on a, on a, you know, a sailing ship for a six month voyage, you might want to sort of pack in a few of them so they've got some company and things like that. And also so that when they get there, they've got company because again, if they're not Scottish, they're rocking up here and they may not have any sort of extended family network. The Scots may have, you know, the Angus coming from Jamaica may well have an aunt, an uncle, or cousins, or grandparents in Aberdeen or, or near Aberdeen. So, okay, they, they've got a sort of a support network. But you kind of wonder, Jose Maria Montalegre, you know, what's going on when he's showing up? Um, um, great. Amanda's asking, when did the first woman arrive at either university? Was Marshall ahead of Kings in that respect? Um, neither. It's, it's post-Union. So um, all the Scottish universities, um, are much earlier in admitting women and, and allowing them to take degrees than their English counterparts. To be honest, largely that's a result of being poor and needing to, the, the fees that are paid for matriculation and graduation. Um, what is interesting, I think I want to say it's the early 1890s or perhaps even the 1880s when um, an American woman comes from Connecticut to, to study at the University of Aberdeen. Um, she only stays for a year and goes back. And it's fairly clear she goes back because her father has died. And I think that that has meant either she's required back for you know taking care of siblings or simply because the money isn't there. And her father was um, a, an officer in the American Civil War. So you have this really, again, this sort of visual image of this woman just from Connecticut showing up in Aberdeen in the latter part of the 19th century. And you just think, what are these people thinking? I know, it's crazy. And especially when you were talking about, um, you know, the, the again, the international students, and because they were so much younger, you know, in, in beginning their university career than we are now, because you said like, what, 14, 15 sometimes? 14 and 15 aren't unknown. I would say that most of the ones, um, particularly by the time you're getting to the latter part of the 18th century, are probably arriving at the age of about 16. 
So, you know, well, they, because it's six months to get around the world, they may have started out at 16. It might be 17 by the time they arrive, but, that, but they are young. Um, but remember, the sort of age at which most Scots are going to the East India Company is 14 to 16. Yeah, yeah, Chloe, it's, it's, it's almost, it's all entirely out of our um, matriculant and graduate rec graduation records, um, which are all published, um, which is why I say what I've talked about here is the absolute minimum, because these are the, these books, it's what they record that I'm going on. There will probably be many more who went abroad, but it just isn't recorded in this and may have gone abroad later in life. Um, and it could well be that that some of them may have been born abroad, but because they moved, they were sent home and may have lived for a couple of years. I don't you know, for example, in 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 Fraserburgh and are coming to the university. And when they're asked, where are you from, are putting in the matriculation book from Fraserburgh. They might well have been born in Jamaica. We just don't know. So this is the tip of the iceberg. And it's a pretty big tip. So that suggests the iceberg might be pretty big as well. <laughs> That's incredible. I think that's it for questions. Um, unless anyone's got anything else, we've got lots of uh, extra time if anyone's got anything they want to ask. Oh, here we go. Okay. June's asking, you were saying a lot had relatives here, but where would most of them live or be accommodated or, um, off the, sorry, if live or be accommodated um, if they didn't have? Uh, being so young, it must have been so hard. Um, well, so I, I think I was saying this to Nicole just yes, Wednesday when we were chatting. Um, most students lived with professors. So we, we think of these big professorial houses on the channelry, and I think our visual image is that, you know, there's, there's the small professorial family living in a big house with lots of servants. Um, in actual fact, a lot of rooms would have been let out because particularly before the union, a lot of the, the sort of financial structure was is that that students paid to attend lectures or they had paid for private tuition so I, I mentioned one of them was a private student so um, Jose Maria arrives as a private student now that may have had something to do with a language barrier issue he may have arrived at a pri as a private student until he felt confident enough to matriculate um, more formally so Professors are receiving money from students who attend their lectures, who receive private tuition, and who are lodging in their houses. So I would imagine that a lot of these, and in fact, it, it may well be the case, I think as your, your question um, implies, that the, if you will, on-campus student body at the time would be more likely to have been from abroad than, than particularly Marshall, where you, know, you could live in town and just walk to Marshall College. Kings would be, I think, again, this is one of the reasons Kings is smaller um, and, and attracts a different student body. We, we tend to forget Kings is in the middle of the countryside and, and it is a dinky village. So there's not going to be as much sort of housing. And that's, that's why many of the professors at Kings also have jobs as professors at Marshall. And my guess is they probably have their houses in the town rather than in the middle of the countryside. <laughs> That's right, because I asked Billy yesterday how he would feel if the expectation was that his students all had to move in with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would be, you know, as troubled if they had to pay up money every time they came to a lecture. Um, <laughs> but, but of course, the, the, the way in which people don't attend lectures anymore might not make that work. <laughs> yeah, Chloe's saying it's so it's, strange to think of Kings being in the countryside. It's, it's also, you know, I where the Mount Hooley roundabout is, the, the reason why that former school and now uh, um, accommodation is called Causeway N is because there was a causeway there because the Mount Hooley roundabout was a lock and a marsh and and marsh and um, and the and if, if you look at um, where the heating plant was built at the university and across Bedford Road the the playing grounds for the for the high school that was all a kind of a marshy lake so it, it actually implies that that not only it's in the country, but there's a lot of less dry ground. Yeah, we, we are returning um, the one. We have a Benin bronze that's being returned. We've returned some other things. So there's a lot of discussions going on about this. And and it's it is, I think, a, a, a really good sort of exercise. I think it's, you know, one of the things we, we have to think about is not only how do things come into our possession, but you know, how do we benefit in some ways? There's a, 
there's a fund that still provides money for schools in Aberdeenshire, um, which is entirely based on a huge endowment in the early 19th century from a slave slaveholder. Mm -hmm. And that's been providing monies to local education for, well, since, I don't know, the 1810s, 1820s. And you, and you think that, but this is, so it's, it's, it's money that, it's wealth that has been taken from Jamaica, but has never done any good in Jamaica at all. And, and it's, it raises all kinds of questions that are, that are difficult and, and sometimes quite distressing. Um, but I think they're ones that we have to sort of think about. I don't know if any of you have ever visited Leith Hall, um, which isn't normally open to the public, but I went once when it was open to the public. And, um, you know, right in the, one of the rooms is Tipu Sultan's throne. And uh, you think, so one of the leaders of the, 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 the Indian mutiny, when his palace was sacked, some Scot from the northeast of Scotland picked up the throne and took it home and put it in his front room. Now, you know, that, that really does raise all kinds of questions about that thing being there. And, and not least because, you know, the argument, well, people can see it if it's here. I find that argument I'm dubious at times, but Leith Hall's closed to the public. No one can see it, but that's where it is. Yeah, it's you know, very tricky, isn't it? Well, that, rather similar to, you know, the Stone of Destiny, uh, having sat for years under the throne at Westminster and, and you know, have, having been brought home. Well, Tipu Sultan's throne is sitting in the in an obscure country house in the northeast of Scotland. Yeah. I don't think it's anything else. You've got a couple more minutes. We'll give you if you've got anything else you want to say or anything else you want to ask. Yeah, it is. It is an eclectic, and and I think that's a comment on, on on where the students went because it's largely students sending stuff back, and it gives you an idea of just how widely they disperse across the globe and they send back some really quite random things, and so the result is the the collection is um, I think eclectic is a good word for it. You know, a a random storage cupboard might also be a good word for it sometimes. That's a good idea. Um, so uh, people said maybe a video tour sometime. Maybe maybe a video tour sometime. <laughs> well, I think that's it. Um, I hope not anything else come in. So if you do think of anything you want to ask after, you can always email us at alumni at abdn.ac.uk and we can follow up with you. Um, so all that's left for me to do is say a huge thank you, as always, to Bill for lending us his time when he's so busy. It's so, so appreciated. My pleasure, as always, my pleasure. And thanks for everyone for coming coming out today. And I'm sure we'll we'll be asking you back again <laughs> in the new year. Okay. <laughs> thanks everybody. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, your evening, night, wherever you are in the world. I hope you and have a lovely weekend as well. Thanks everyone. Bye now. <laughs>